Hello, everyone. This is Karen Kolenovich, and welcome to the Integrated Empath, where we are exploring many ways that highly influential empaths have used their sensitivity and creativity to forge joyful lives and thriving careers. Our collective goal is to inspire you to embrace your unique gifts and create your own success stories in your personal life and in your business. Today, it's my absolute pleasure to have a conversation with author and writing coach, Lauren Sapala. For those of you who are sensitive, intuitive, artistic souls, you are in for a delight with today's expert. And let me tell you a little bit about Lauren. She is, of course, a writer, and she coaches writers, and she's also the author of the book, The INFJ Writer. She began working with blocked writers in 2009 when she founded the Wright City Writing Group in Seattle, and then she expanded the program to San Francisco in 2010. She became a full-time writing coach in 2013, working as an advocate for writers in one-on-one -on -one sessions designed to help bring the writer's cre creative dreams into existence with unconditional love and support. Lauren's articles on creativity, personality theory, and sensitive intuitive writers can be found at her blog, laurensapala.com. In between coaching writers and wrangling her two-year-old son, she's currently working on her next book titled Between the Shadow and Low, which is an autobiographical novel detailing her years in Seattle. And that will be available spring 2017. And she'll talk a little bit about that as we get deeper into our conversation. Welcome to the Integrated Empath, Lauren. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Oh, it's so wonderful to have you. And I just can't wait to jump into this conversation all about creativity and the INFJ writer. So you have, you know, you've really kind of have this niche with the INFJ writer. So for those of, of our listeners who are not familiar, can you kind of share a little bit about what, what that is? Um, well, I always urge people to go online and look up Myers-Briggs. Um, I know it's a little okay. bit controversial. Sometimes people really are not into it. Um, sometimes people really are into it. I was one of the people that discovered this personality system, and I got into it. Uh, basically, it's it's derived from the work of Carl Jung, and it says, you know, everybody has different functions in their personality. And some people use, um, you know, emotional functions. Some people use intellectual functions. There's intuition versus sensing. There's a whole bag of stuff to learn about. Um, but basically, INFJs and INFPs are the introverted, intuitive folks. These are the people who they interpret life through their emotions, through their intuition. Um, and they're usually introverted. There are extroverted intuitive people as well. Um, but all of these people tend to be highly sensitive, highly creative, empathetic, compassionate, and empathic. Um, so, yeah, that's what the INFJ is in a nutshell. There's a lot mm -hmm. more information online, though. I really urge people to research it on their own. Yes, and I've found that it, it's actually a comfort to do something like that because then it's like, oh, my gosh, you know. Why yeah. this this kind of gives some sort of framework um, to what people have experienced and and their life path because I am also an INFJ and it just you know there's so much uh, relief in that you know that oh my gosh I'm not the only one like this so being an INFJ as as part of your personality that's such a an integral part of what you do as a writer and as a writing coach so what you know how how do you, how have you included this in your own writing? How do you kind of maximize your gifts? Um, well, let me start by saying how I got there. So I, I had horrible trouble writing. I always wanted to be a writer from the time I was a small child. And I had so much trouble writing, I just thought there was something wrong with me. And I just did horribly in my creative writing classes in college. Um, but when I was writing on my own, I, I did pretty well. I gave up writing for a long time. And then I found it again. Um, in 2007, I joined a writing program that was based on one silent hour of writing. And I really started to do a lot of writing work in this way. 
And then I got on the Internet and looked around, and I felt like I was doing horribly again because there were all of these rules to follow. You know, you had to have story structure and a story arc, and your protagonist had to have these three things. And I wasn't doing any of that. And I was having so many problems writing in even a linear way. I would write fragments, and I would write them on cocktail napkins and grocery store receipts, you know, and put them all in a shoebox and then stitch them together, and it was this wild, crazy quilt. And for so many years, I just thought, yeah, I'm just weird. I'm just, there's something wrong with me. I'm a bad writer. I love to do it, but I'm just bad at it. Um, mm-hmm. And then I, I formed these writing groups, and the people who were attracted to the groups, I started talking to them, and they were the exact same way. They were dreamy. They were super sensitive people. They were writing these observations down on napkins and shoving them in their purse or backpack and then stitching them together later. <laughs> You know, and I thought, well, this can't be a coincidence. Um, so I started my blog, and I started writing about the issues that I saw the people in my writing group going through. And I wrote a couple articles um, when I discovered I was an INFJ on INFJ writers. And these articles, I was getting emails about them. I was getting hits on them, like, you know, years later. So I thought that there's something there. This is something real, and I'm not the only one going through it. And that's when I really started to get into personality theory. And I started taking on clients, and lo and behold, the ones that really stuck were INFJs and INFPs. And they shared the exact same challenges as I did, as the people in my writing group did. So that's when I really knew this isn't, there's not something wrong with me. This is actually a gift. I'm working with the subconscious in a way um, that a lot of other people can't. And INFJs and INFPs and these super sensitive empath people, we have the ability to do that, and that's a gift, and we can use it in our writing. Yes, and so that brings me to this thought of, okay, so along your journey, um, because it's always a journey when we start something new, uh, what helped you to really develop into an author from just being a sensitive writer to an actual author and actually fulfilling your call to, to connect with other writers. What, what kinds of things, um, events, obstacles came up for you along that path? Well, the thing I will say, and I was kind of laughing when you introduced me as an expert because I never felt like an expert and every step of the journey, that was really where the self doubt came in. Um, when I started the writing group, I thought, who am I to start a writing group? I've never done this before. I don't have any training. I'm not an expert. But I thought, well, I'll just start it and see what happens. And maybe I'll be nervous and scared, but I'll do it anyway. Um, and people showed up. You know, a person told a friend who told a friend, and, and people kept showing up. And then I thought the same thing with the blog. I thought, well, who am I to start a blog? I'm no expert. I don't know anything. I've never had a blog before. But I said, okay, I'll just do it anyway. I'm nervous and scared, but I'll do it. Um, And I did it, and people really responded. People started following me, and people started reading and sharing the articles on Twitter and social media. Um, And then, so, you know, things sort of built. Uh, Same thing with being a writing coach. I thought, who am I to be a writing coach? I really bit my nails over that one. Like, I have no certification. I didn't go to coaching college. You know, no one, like, gave me a degree in this. I just... I felt the call to do it, and I felt I could really help people. So I thought, well, I'll put a, you know, post up on my website that says, hey, I'm taking clients, and then I'll talk to some people on the phone and see what happens. You know, I really had no idea what I was doing, um, and it wasn't easy. It, You know, those first few calls, I just thought I was going to, like, seriously, you know, throw up or wet my pants. I was so nervous. You know, it was like yeah. I was an 11 on scale to 1 to 10. My voice was shaking <laughs> when I talked to these people. But I made it through, and it got easier. Um, and the same thing with the book. You know, I, I was listening to webinars on sales and marketing. I was really interested in growing my business. And I listened to one webinar, and the woman said, if you have a gift of making something, if you're good at making videos or you're good at graphic design or you're good at writing, make something and put it out there. Just put your product out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. And I just thought, I could write a book on INFJ Writers. She said it doesn't have to be perfect. I was sort of waiting for someone to say, okay, now you're the expert. You're allowed. And she kind of gave me permission. Yeah, Yeah. you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be the expert. I think so many of us, especially highly sensitive people, are waiting to be the expert or waiting until we have higher self-esteem. And I can just say, like, 
that feeling of higher self-esteem, it's probably not coming because I still don't have it. Right. You know? Oh, my goodness. So true. Yeah. Yeah. We can be such perfectionists and so hard on ourselves when, you know, we are, in effect, keeping our gift from others if we don't just step into doing it like you did. You know, it's like you felt nervous and scared, but you did it anyway. <laughs> you know, and I think that there's no, I mean, sometimes there's not a graceful way to do it. There's just doing it, and then it gets easier. Is I yeah. mean, I I've, I can certainly relate to that, too. It's, it's just like you, you get out there and you do it. And so, I mean, as far as these obstacles, it's like you've just put one foot in front of the other, and things started coming together, and clients clients kept coming, and, you know, your articles. I mean, I found your articles a while back, and I've been following you for quite some time. So it's, it just shows that once you put something out into the world, you release it, and it's almost like you don't – it takes on a life of its own. And exactly. How, how has that been for you as an experience as, as a sensitive empath? Um, it's been great. It's it's sort of puzzling at times because in my own head, I've always felt like I'm totally weird. I've been called weird a lot in my life. Um, I have a lot of trouble with, like, normal things that normal people do. Like, I'm not very organized. I'm bad at math. You know, I don't like to go to the football game and hang out. Like, I've always been, like, the weirdo in the corner reading her book. Um, and I've always sort of felt like a spaz. So I get emails now every week from people who say, you know, I admire you so much, or I had to work up the nerve to send you this email, and I'm like, me? I, you had to work up the nerve to send me an email? Like, I'm totally a spaz, you know? Um, and that's what I thought when I first started taking clients, is I was so nervous, and I thought these people were going to demand credentials, and that I had to be perfect, and I got on the phone with them, and they were nervous, too. Their voice was cracking, too. They would never done anything like this before, either, you know? So that's been really wonderful to see that people are really kind, and we're we're really all suffering from the same insecurity issues inside our own heads. We're all scared that we're not doing it right, and that someone else is above us. And it's it's just not true once you start talking to people. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's so much that goes on in our in our heads that that you're right. It's not true, and it's just a matter of like breaking out of that and and letting letting things happen in the way that that. Uh, is going to serve you as as a writer, as as a creative, and whatever that looks like for you. Um, just having the courage to step into it and and not have to have the control over people's reactions or you know be having it come across a certain way. I mean, just just putting it out there is 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 enough. And oftentimes it's it's more than enough, and it's a gift to other people. And so. I know that you do a lot of work with intuitive writers and, you know, specifically when it comes to the writing or the creative process, what are some of the challenges that that the INFJ writers face as they tackle their creative creative work and their writing? Well, this is the thing. I, I feel that um, our culture is not really made for sensitive, empathic, intuitive people. Um, mm -hmm. Our culture teaches us that we're really the only people who are alive. Like, animals are just there for us to use. The environment's just there for us to harvest. You know, everything's sort of like this unliving, inanimate thing. And that goes the same for manuscripts. If you if you read a lot of, like, how to write things on the Internet, it's sort of like beat this manuscript into submission. You know, like you write this story, you write an outline, you make it fit, you make your characters do certain, very certain things, and if they don't obey, like you just kill them off. You know, it's just this very harsh, like get it done, logical, checking it off the outline to-do list thing. And the thing yeah, is, it's very rigid. Yeah, for sensitive intuitives, their manuscripts. I always say, this is a living being. This is like working with a garden. This is not working with a to-do list. You go out and you plant some seeds, and you take care of those seeds. And some of them come up, and some of them don't. You know, and some of the, sometimes you have a great garden that year. You're like, I have more tomatoes than I know what to do with. The zucchinis aren't doing so well. But it's not something you can control. 
And that illusion and control is what the sensitive intuitive needs to give up. It's been taught to us by mainstream culture that, like, well, if you just work hard enough, if you just grit your teeth and bear down, you can control everything because that's what humans do. We control. And that's a complete illusion. And once the sensitive intuitive gives that up, they realize that they actually feel more at home in the irrational side of life, in the subconscious side of life, in the dream world where you can't control anything. You're just in response to it. And that's what I always tell my writers. You're working in response to your manuscript. Your characters will do things you never expected. The plot will take turns that you can't anticipate. It will probably not look like you think it should look. That's okay. It's not about you. You're just there to work with it. You're just there to be the channel and the sculptor. You don't get to say in what the final product is. And that's hard at first to let go, but once the sensitive intuitive does let go, oh, the release, they're like, oh, I can, all of these fragments that are coming to me and these phrases and these images and these symbols, I can just write them down and I don't have to worry about if they're correct or right or if someone else will understand them. I can just go with this flowing river. I can just tend the garden and I can see what shows up in, in the summer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and it, it sounds like a much more enjoyable process as as they're able to release that control and just surrender to the you know the life of whatever it is that they're working on because yeah. it does come sort of randomly i mean i've got post-its everywhere or you know even on my phone it's like there's a lot of different places and times where a certain sentence or paragraph will come through rather quickly and it's like if i don't write it down it's gone and it's just I don't know where it goes at the time, but it's writing it down and then trusting that, oh, maybe I can find a place for it. You know, maybe this is one of those seeds, you know, that I need to plant and nurture into something bigger. And I love the um, the image of the garden and um, all of that because it truly makes sense that not everything that we do write down is going to grow into something big. And we just have to be okay with um you know, just what is meant to blossom and, and what was just sort of a thought that just came passing through. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that you shared in, in your um, your long bio is how uh, there was a there was a moment where, um, you know, you had somebody who was quite critical of your writing and it became it kind of led you down a, a certain road of uh, questioning your own talents and gifts so do you find that your INFJ writers have similar experiences where they have been hurt in a certain way to the point where they have shut down or need encouragement because you mentioned um, unconditional love and support when you coach your writers. So do you find that they have certain blocks around criticism and, um, you know, being judged, things like that? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. INFJs, um, you know, and I've had a few different experiences, but we've all had some sort of, usually in early childhood, experience where we realize that we're different and other mm -hmm. people don't get it. And we don't really get it. We can see that we're different. Um, you know, I remember when I was in third grade, I watched this girl in the playground just torture a bee, you know, and it upset me so much that she would torture this insect. And I asked, I said, what are you doing? Why would you do such a thing? And she said, well, bees sting. They're bad. And even at eight years old, I, I knew, like, there's something so different between me and this girl, between her mindset and her beliefs and her approach to life. And is there something wrong with me? And when I would share this, that I'm really upset about this. People would say it's just an insect or, you know, and this, for other people, it's different experiences. Maybe it's, um, you know, watching the news and they see something horrible going on in a, another part of the world where people are really uh, dealing with violence or abuse in some way. And this is really affecting them. And people say, well, get over it. It's just the news. You just move on with your life. There's nothing you can do. So from an early age, INFJs and INFPs, and extroverted intuitive people as well, the ENFJs and ENFPs, usually have these experiences where they know they're different, they're not quite sure why, and they tend to think it's a weakness, so they hide mm -hmm. it. 
they start hiding it and they become very good at hiding it. They usually cultivate a persona that they use. Um, you know, maybe they're, they push themselves to be more extroverted, to go to the office party, to engage in the chit chat. They act like things don't bother them when they deeply bother them. They become very, very good at sort of uh, having this smiling or impassive mask that they use. And it's hard to put that down because it feels safe. They've been doing it for so long. So usually when I start coaching someone, the first few sessions is just getting through that because they really think the first couple of calls, I mean, they'll call me and say, oh, I didn't write anything this week, and I know you're going to yell at me. And when I say, like, no, that's, this, that's not how this works. Like, I'm just here. This is just a space. This hour is a space for you. And it, has, it doesn't matter what you did or didn't do this week. This hour is just a safe space for you to sort of, like, expand and see what, what's there and what's going on. And they're like, really? I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> you know, I've never <laughs> experienced this before. Um, and maybe they've done therapy in the past. So they're very good at, like, going over old wounds and, like, well, let's poke at these old wounds. And when I'm like, well, that's fine if you want to do that in this hour, but I'm not going to poke at the old wounds with you. Like, I'm just holding the space. So mm -hmm. you can go visit the past, but you can also move forward if you want, or you can just sit here in the present. It's a space. You can do whatever you want. That's really weird to them. And it takes a few sessions for them to get used to it. And then they're like, oh, this is cool. Like, I just <laughs> have this space. I can just do whatever I want. Total freedom. I can play. I can be my weird self. Um, and a lot of INFJs and INFPs, a lot of intuitive people, we have this dark side, too. We're so afraid of looking at our own shadow because it feels so so icky to us. We're so sensitive that we're like, how could I have had this, that vicious thought about that person? You know, I'm just a jerk. And to bring that out into the, the light as well is very relieving, I find. And that's something that I also have to work with sensitive intuitives on. Yeah, I, I would imagine that that's extremely helpful because those are aspects that, that we are not – usually allowed, you know, to, to express, um, you know, and, and we don't always feel safe expressing that. So, you know, your coaching, it sounds, it sounds like way beyond writing. You oh, know, yeah, it's it the whole like thing. Coaching. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. just had a client the other day where she said, oh, well, I, I'm so sorry I brought that up. That's a personal problem. And I said, you can bring anything you want to the sessions. It's not all about your characters. It's a whole tapestry. Your your experiences and thoughts and feelings and what's happening to you right now, that's all tied into your writing. This is your artistic work as a human being. Of course it's all tied in. And I, I love how you're acknowledging that because it is in our sensitivity and our ability to feel deeply that we are able to translate that into our gift, whether it be writing or speaking, we're able to channel that into a specific place when we are given, we, when we give ourselves the freedom to do that. And you're a catalyst in that process as far as letting people let go of all of that fear. <laughs> the fear mindset of like, oh my gosh, this isn't good enough, or oh my gosh, this is going to be judged. You help people kind of cut through all of that and just, and just be who they need to be, recognizing that, you know, this painful experience shows me something about myself and I can actually use that in, in a positive way if I choose or not even include it at all, but just knowing that that piece of their personality is not a weakness, you know, that sort of weird quality or that, you know, hypersensitivity is, can be used in, in a way that, um, is good in a way that propels them forward in a way that brings out their their own unique personality have you found that your clients um, go off in different directions like they'll start with something and then end up with with a product that's totally different like what oh, is their all journey? The time. okay what does that yeah. look like? I mean, all the time. I, usually, someone will come to me as a client with a very um, specific project in mind, like, "Oh, I've wanted to write this memoir for 20 years, and I've never done it," um, or "I really want to work on my poetry." And then, as we start working together, other things will come up. Um, and that's another thing that sensitive intuitives are highly creative people, and highly creative people 
uh, the creative imagination never shuts off. So the more you start opening up the channel of creativity, the more ideas start coming through. And the more characters start lining up like a queue, like, oh, she's taking orders, get in line, get in line, guys, you know. And that can be very intimidating for people because they say, well, I really wanted to work on my memoir, but now I'm having all of these ideas for other projects. And they've been taught in school that you need to start with one thing, move through in a linear way until you finish, and then you move on to the next task. A lot of offices work that that way as well. Um, Usually sensitive, intuitive people can fake it very well. They usually do work in offices and sort of like low-conflict environments. So they're very good at, at like, I'm the nice, productive worker. I get things done on the to-do list. Uh, So when all of these ideas start coming through and they're like, I want to work on, you know, poetry instead of the memoir, or now I want to work on a nonfiction project, they question everything. Um, And that's okay. That's something I help people work with, too, is that this – This belief in a straight line, which is another thing our culture is really into, like time moves in a straight line, right, and your tasks Mm -hmm. should move in a straight line, and your day moves in a straight line, that's all, that's just a a certain belief. Um, You can choose to use that belief or not. You can put it down any time you want. Highly creative people, their brains usually work in circles, uh, which is a little bit uncomfortable for people because they say, something's wrong with me. I'm working in a circle. I'm moving in a circle. I I was on this fragment, and then I abandoned it, and I was pulled towards this thing, and then I abandoned that, and I'm coming back. And I say, you're not abandoning anything. You're just looping. You're working in a circle, and that's okay. Time can be a circle for you. You can pick up that belief and use it if it's helpful to you in this moment. That's something I really work with clients on, and sensitive intuitives, is that um, there are so many different beliefs you can choose from. Like, they're just infinite beliefs, and you can choose your beliefs. And if there's a belief in your mind, like it's sort of like software running on your computer, if there's a a piece of software that's sort of gunking up the system and it's too slow and it's outdated, you can uninstall it. You know, it's not always easy, but you can uninstall a belief and reinstall a new one that works a lot better for you. Um, So that's something I really like to work with people on this belief system. I love that. And do you find that people um, who who do fit this personality profile of being sensitive and intuitive, you know, it, do you find that once they are aware that, okay, I'm an INFJ or I'm an INFP, this helps me so much because then I understand myself better and I can, I can be nonlinear, I can be kind of random and just run with it? Yes, for sure. Well, it also helps because they not only see that nothing's wrong with them, but nothing's wrong with other people either. Everybody just is different. And Mm -hmm. even though that seems like such an obvious conclusion, we've spent most of our life, you know, sort of ricocheting back and forth between I'm wrong, no, he's wrong. Something's bad and about me, no, the rest of humanity is all messed up, you know. And so we really go, like, back and forth on this. And when we realize that, no, I am just this way, I'm wired this way, and other people are wired a different way, it's not personal anymore. You know, it's not like, oh, they're just willfully being horrible human beings and I don't get them. It's like, no, they're not. They actually enjoy going to the football game and being around a huge crowd of people who are screaming in their ear. Like, that's fun. Like, you know, for years I was like, I don't understand it. And it's really troubling to me that I can't understand why people would choose to do this, you know. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But it's okay. You know, it's like, uh, it's you know, just to go back to that image of the the garden, it's like different flowers need different types of care. You know, like your orchid plant is going to need a particular environment and care, whereas a sunflower is going to need something totally different. So I love this, the recognition that we are all different, and it is okay, but just the fact that you're giving people, uh, you know, a frame of reference to understand that the way that they are is okay. It's great. It's wonderful. And it can be, you know, once they, they recognize that, oh, my gosh, this is how I am, you know, I am an orchid <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, that they can, there's a, there's a, a comfort and a safety in that because then they, they can be who they are and, and operate the way that they need to to really thrive in their lives and, and feel a sense of, of, of joy. They well, don't have I to think conform. this is why 
this is why the introvert awareness movement has gained such popularity because people are now understanding, oh, it's actually that different parts of my brain light up in a different way than an extrovert's brain. So Mm -hmm. when I'm around conflict or anger or heightened emotion or, or like the football game at the stadium, that doesn't feel good to me. It feels very overwhelming and like I've been injected with this toxic cocktail and I don't like it. My body doesn't like it. But for an extrovert, that feels exciting. You know, it's like mm-hmm. this big adrenaline rush. That feels really good to them. It physically feels good. And once you understand that difference, it's like, oh, okay, it's not that I'm just, you know, sort of weak or I can't handle conflict or I'm not assertive enough. It's that I'm having a physical reaction that's very real. Yes. And when <laughs> – and that's a very empathic quality, you know, it's an, an, an introverted or highly sensitive um, experience because it, we literally feel it in our bodies, you know, when, we're, when we get so much information and energy from, from our environment. So for you personally, like, you know, do you, do you have ways that you deal with um, – the invitations that you get from people or even when you do go into an environment that has a lot of people, do you have specific strategies that you use to kind of move the energy through you so it doesn't get stuck? Um, Well, I wish I could tell you that I go to the football game and it's all great because I have this strategy and I get home and I just do a (laughs) cleanse and it's awesome. I I still struggle with it. Um, I still have to go to work events and parties and things and I really don't enjoy them. I do try to avoid them as much as possible. As I've gotten older, it's gotten a lot easier to say, no, I don't like parties. I I would love Mm -hmm. to meet you one-on-one for coffee or tea some Saturday morning, um, but I don't do well at parties and I don't do well staying up late. (laughs) You know, and I'm just, I don't feel badly saying those things now. Um, The thing that I have really found that I still struggle with, a lot of times if I'm around someone who is experiencing heavy anger or depression or uh, some sort of negativity, and they're not really um, emotionally aware enough to deal with it, I'll get sort of walloped by that. And a lot of times I don't realize it's not me still. It's only like an hour or two later when I have the migraine headache and I'm in the bedroom with all the blinds closed that I say, oh, it was that woman at the party. Do you know what I mean? Oh, it's not me. And then when I say, oh, this isn't, if if this isn't mine, like I'm going to send it back and it lifts, then I'm like, oh, wow, okay, why did it take me two hours this time to put the pieces together? That still happens frequently. Yeah, I mean, I still have moments like that, too, because it's like we are living our lives and we, we constantly don't want to be in that space of um, defensiveness. It's like we want to go out. But I like how you said that you're, you just say no. I mean, that's, that's a respect for yourself that I think a lot of people who are empathic, you know, people pleasers at first, it's hard for them to say, no, thank you. You know, that, and, and it's like, you don't even have to give a reason why, but just saying no, it does get easier. <laughs> well, one is you get older, but it just gets easier with practice. Because then you, you think about what, what is the outcome going to be? Like, am I going to be at home reading my book or just having a relaxing evening versus going out to this big convention? And it's like there's no comparison. So I just like how you are really clear with what is going to work for me and what is not and really listening to your own, your own intuition or just your own feelings about it and, and going with that instead of with what other people need from you or what they want from you, because it is, it's hard for people when they first start out, um, recognizing that, oh my gosh, I do better in some environments and and not in others. And then that's something, yeah, that's something that's going to be an ongoing work for the sensitive Yeah, is boundary work. And it's literally like a daily thing. Um, It gets easier, but it's never like you reach this point where you're like, great, now I know about healthy boundaries and I never have to worry about it again. I'm just good. It's like I'm the Dalai Lama. I just, it's easy. You know, that's, that's right. not going to happen. It's always going to be a daily thing. Yes, it is. I mean, we, we, I don't have it all figured out, but I know like certain things that kind of work to, to release and move things through. And 
but that awareness piece is, is big because sometimes that energy does just, it just descends on us or it just gets lodged in our bodies. And it's like, whoa, what happened? So recognizing that sometimes when you do have a physical symptom, it might be a result of an energetic uh, intrusion, you know, from someone else's emotions because that does happen and, it, and you are not crazy when those things happen. You know, I could go to an event with, you know, a couple hundred people and just be enjoying the moment and then suddenly I'm dizzy. You know, uh-huh. and it's like, what is going on? So I still have those moments because I don't, I guess I don't live my life in a way that I'm afraid of everything, but I, and then there are some events that I still have to go to, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, I just, it's a part of it. And then I'm like, okay, I, I do need to go to this. I want to go to this. Um, and then there is a result that happens where I'm like, oh, wow, you know, it's this again. And so just, being aware of that and knowing that there's nothing crazy about you and it's just finding tools that work for your own system and and your energy because it is it is an ongoing process and i I love that you said oh it's this again because i think sensitive intuitives experience that so much you know i had to go to a holiday party last december and i don't drink at all i don't drink any alcohol and i was there you know for three or four hours and the next day i was wrecked it was like i was hung over I was tired. I felt like I was getting sick. There was a good chance I was going to get sick. I was just in a really bad place, and I thought, oh, it's this again. Like, I mm-hmm. went to a normal party that normal people should be able to go to, and it's this again. And there is that tendency to beat myself up. Well, you know, I should have done an energy cleansing after the party, or I should have gone into it and, like, put up my, like, bubble of light. You know, I, it's like it's my fault, yeah. but it's not. Like, it's just never going to be easy. I'm never going to be able to be the person who can be at the four-hour party without after right. effects. Right. And it's funny because a lot of um, intuitives and, and people who are sensitive, it's like when they have a big event, usually they don't plan something the next day. <laughs> you know, they kind of clear yeah. their calendars because of that. So it it is something that happens to a lot of people and we just sort of respect ourselves once we know that this is a part of who we are, that we can take that time to relax and regroup after, you know, a, a time when we're spending, when we're being bombarded with energy of other people, we do need that time to recover. That's part of yes. it too. <laughs> Yeah, aren't we lucky? And you know, on the flip side, it's like, gosh, you know, all this the sensitivity that we have can really open us up to, um, you know, channeling that into our creativity. So, going back to the topic of writing and your book, the INFJ writer, um, what advice can you give to writers about things to focus on as they create and things? to not focus on as they move forward? Well, I always tell my clients, when you're in the first draft, the most important thing I want you to do is get a basket. It can be a physical basket. It can be a file folder on your desktop, whatever. But it's one location, and that's where you put all of your scraps. So your scraps of scenes that you've written, your cocktail napkins where you've jotted down that phrase, you know, um, a description of an image. You put all of your pieces in that basket. And you just keep adding to it until you feel done. You feel like, okay, I want to, I want to take the pieces out and stitch them together. That's the thing to focus on is gathering the pieces as they come out of you and being neutral about the pieces as they come out of you. There's such a tendency to judge each piece. Well, that's bad writing. Or, oh, that memory about my aunt, I can't use that. She's going to hate me if I put that in the book. That kind of judgment as far as possible, if you could just neutralize it and say, hey, we don't know what's going to go in the book yet. All the, all we know is that this is going in the basket, and no one's ever going to see the basket, so it doesn't matter, you know, because yeah. all the pieces mm-hmm. in the basket. Um, what not to focus on, don't worry about writing in chronological order. Don't worry. Please do not go on the Internet and read a bunch of writing blogs. Like, I know that seems like it's being helpful. It's not helpful. You will read, like, three things that your antagonist needs to do to be the perfect villain and four plot points you need in the hero's turn. Like, just, it's all crap. I mean, just don't worry about it. Worry about it when you get to the editing phase if you really need to know something about a villain. But right now, 
just concentrate on the relationship that you have with your work, that intimate, very private, very personal relationship. And whatever shows up, love it, bless it. Say that it's okay for it to be there, and more pieces will start coming. That's beautiful. Just giving yourself the permission, and I love these strategies that you're giving to to help people gather their thoughts in a way that fits with their mind. <laughs> you know, it's like we don't have to have this outline of everything in order. And I love the basket. I'm going to do that because, um, yeah, <laughs> if, if you could see my computer screen, it's got like 15 different windows open because I am working on 15 different things at the same time. So yeah. it's kind of that idea of like just going going with, with what comes to you and, and where your inspiration is and then then revisiting it and putting it all together. It really makes sense. I'm going to do that. <laughs> and not putting things in order. Because I find like, I mean, you just get a sentence or two and it's like, ooh, this is a good one. I could really expand on this. And then it, it takes a life of its own. So I love that. Well, and that's something I tell uh, creative intuitives, too, is because people feel so guilty about, well, yesterday I was working on the prologue to my book, and today I'm really being pulled to look up Victorian, you know, Jack the Ripper stuff on the Internet. Like that, I'm just pulled. Follow that pull. Follow that magnet pull. It's okay to switch between things. It's okay to jump between projects. It's okay to write a fragment here and a fragment there. That is totally okay. You don't need to stick to one thing until it's done. Follow the magnet pull. Every day you will wake up, you will be pulled towards something. Most sensitive, creative intuitives are fighting that every day, and they're swimming upstream because they think they shouldn't do it that way. Follow your natural rhythm. I love the conviction that you speak with and you share that because this is coming from you as your own experience, you know, and it's like you, you've you got tried and true um, strategies that you're giving and it's like because you've experienced this and you've seen a lot of people able to transform their frustration into freedom with with some of these techniques so I I mean I love that I love the magnet pool too it's like follow your inspiration it doesn't matter yeah. if it makes sense or not <laughs> it really doesn't because in the end it usually does we just have to kind of follow those breadcrumbs well, if it's something that scares you as well, that's a very good sign. A lot of people have a big work they would love to to do, but it's about something that scares them. You know, um, I've talked with clients who really want to write about eating disorders, and they're like, I've had an eating disorder, and I know three other people, but I'm not an expert, and it scares me to put myself out there like that. That's a very good sign that you have a big mm-hmm. purpose here. A lot of times when the universe hands us a big purpose, our first reaction is, oh, my gosh, I don't want this. This is so overwhelming. It looks like so much work. It's super scary. I'm giving, I want to give it back. You know, it's sort of like when you first have a baby, like the first week, you're like, I want to give it back. You know, this is too much. Totally. That's a very good sign if you're feeling that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's <laughs> so, you know, for the next book that you have, um, does that kind of fit in? that whole big purpose of like, oh, no, I've been asked to write this book. (laughs) Should I do it? You know, I'm scared. Um, Well, it does. Yeah. I mean, the INFJ writer was something I was writing about my clients primarily. So I was scared, Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't all about me. The next book I'm putting out is autobiographical fiction, and it's Mm -hmm. transgressive fiction. So it's kind of out there, and it's very dark, and it's about my alcoholic years in Seattle. Um, when I was basically living as my shadow self. So I say a lot of crazy things in that book, and I'm like, what are people going to think? It took me 11 years to write the book. Uh, It was not a a fast process at all. And I went through a lot of periods where I was like, this is never going to see the light of day. I don't think this ever should see the light of day. Um, And then the more I talk to people, you know, the more I talk to my clients who have had issues with addiction, issues with abandonment, um, issues with just feeling like, There is something in them that is so just vile and awful. And if anyone knew about it, they would never have friends again. No one would ever love them again. I thought, maybe I should put this book out there. Because I've felt all of these things during those years. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so that's, that book is coming out, Between the Shadow and Low, is coming out in just a few weeks. Oh, my goodness. So it will be out by the time our interview goes live in June. So oh, yeah. You, yes, you all can pick up your copy. Where, where will it be available? Uh, it'll be on Amazon. I do want to give the warning. It's a very dark book. It's not like, a, wow, I just feel so bubbly and light after reading that, you know. Um, it, it's a very dark book. But if people are interested in exploring that darker side, then it's for them, mm -hmm. for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we look at the shadow, and a lot of people cringe at the shadow, and it's such an important aspect of who we are. It makes us who we are. You know, it's like looking at that and being able to integrate that as you have through this book and your own experiences. It's, you know, it's really a beautiful thing, and there's an art to it. It's not, I mean, Art is, is expressive. It's who we are. And I have to tell you, like, as soon as you shared what this book was about, in my mind I was thinking, I can't wait to read it. And oh, wow. Like, yes. I mean, knowing you for, for you know, in a professional light and, and what you offer to other people and then being able to see a more personal side of you that's a little bit more vulnerable, I mean, and, and I guess raw in a way, just, you know, just bare bones, this is my experience. I mean, that's very intriguing, and it's like, I just, I can't wait to read it, you know? Well, and, and, and it's very personal. You won't miss anything. Like, it's all out there. <laughs> it's like, I'm letting it all hang out, really. So, you'll see it all. Well, I admire your courage and, and just your conviction in, in putting it out there and getting it down on the page and your commitment in what was it 12 years of putting this together is that what it was it was you know i i yeah. was doing an exercise in a seminar and they said if you knew you had six months to live what is the one item of unfinished business that would haunt you that you would have to take oh care goodness. of and that that book came up and that's when i knew oh mm -hmm. i gotta publish it i'm scared you know i'm scared to death of what people will think yeah but it, it mm -hmm. is true if i had six months to live that would be the number one item on my list i want to put that book out Ooh, yeah, I was just hit with this wave of like, oh my goodness, just excitement for you, because I think once once it's out there, there's, oh my goodness, people are going to be so healed by that. They're going to identify with you and, and their own shadow and, and their experiences, because we are all united you know, as human beings in our in our experience, and if we choose to look at these darker experiences and uh, see how we can grow from them. I think that is that is why we do what we do because there is a deeper connection as human beings with souls that we can all relate to. And I think that yeah. writing is a part of that that vehicle to bring people together. So thank you, Lauren. I cannot wait to read it. Oh my goodness, I'm excited for you. Well, thank you, Karen, for the encouragement. I need it. Yeah, I mean, it's so true. I mean, I've got, like we spoke about before, it's like we we all have that book inside of us, and it just, it needs to get out there. So if you are sitting on something, you know, take a piece of, of Lauren's advice, you know, many of the different tips that she shared today, and, and follow that and see, see where it takes you, because um, you've got something swirling around. I know it. <laughs> get it down on the page. And uh, so anyway, um, you have you have something that, that you'd like to share with our audience, and this will kind of help people along their creative journey. Can you share a little bit about that? Yes, well, I am offering a free gift, so I'm offering two chapters uh, from the INFJ writer. Now, the book is primarily about writing and creativity, but there are a couple chapters in there specifically for empathic people. And it talks about the INFJ intuitive antenna. And this also goes for INFPs. I want to say, when I'm saying INFJ, I usually mean INFJs and INFPs. Um, that intuitive antenna where we pick up, on, I call them like radio stations coming in, the thoughts and the feelings and the experiences of other people. And they come in all the time. And a lot of times we get them from the collective unconscious. So right now in the world, there's a lot of fear going on. There's a lot of terror there's a lot of bad stuff in the news. And I talk about how uh, sensitive intuitives are very vulnerable 
to that kind of media and that kind of message and some strategies to use to stop being um, exposed to it. I and mean, one of the number one things I say is stop watching the news. I know that's really hard for a lot of people, but I do, I do really encourage stop watching the news. Uh, stop watching the politics. It's, it's all people fighting. It doesn't matter. It's, they're all fighting, you know. Mm-hmm. Concentrate on yourself. Uh, concentrate on your yoga practice, your emotional honesty practice, your creative practice, your writing, your painting, whatever it is that brings you alive. Put your energy into that. Um, and then the other chapter I talk about perfectionism and boundaries and how a lot of sensitive, intuitive people can fall prey to workaholism uh, because we are perfectionists and we do very well in settings where a lot is expected of us, uh, but how this can ultimately stifle our creative spirit. So that's what those two chapters, The Free Gift, are dealing with, boundaries, perfectionism, um, and how to really take care of your intuitive antenna in this life. That, that's very generous of you, Lauren, and I can't wait to, to read those as well because you're speaking my language. <laughs> you really are. It's, and it's, there's such a, a comfort in knowing that, you know, you've put this together and you're, you're someone who has figured it out in terms of creativity and, and how to, to really work with that so that it is more of a strength than it is a weakness. So thank you very much for joining us today, Lauren. It has been awesome. Thank you, Karen. Like I said, I'm so, so honored to be here. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. And I want to thank our audience for you all being here and listening in on today's conversation with Lauren Zapala. We learned so much about how to use our sensitivity to enliven our creative journey. So I hope that you got something out of our interview and whatever has inspired you, write it down, put it into practice and take a small step in the right direction. We are here to support you in making your dreams a reality. Thank you so much for joining us on the Integrated Empath and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.